which is a two-week commercialization and entrepreneurship workshop uh, that runs here in Mars that we do in partnership with CCRM and the Rotman School of Management, as well as the Stem Cell Network this year. Applications for the program are due this Friday, and the program runs from June 6th to June 21st uh, of 2020. So I would encourage anyone that has an interest in learning more about the business side of regenerative medicine uh, to check out the information. You can send me a note if you have questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. And then we've got a few copies of uh, posters that we'll pass around for those that are interested. And then finally, I wanted to thank the McEwen Institute for co-sponsoring uh, the first uh, co-sponsored uh, global speaker talk uh, of 2020. So we're looking forward to partnering with McEwen moving forward. Uh, and we're also um, continue to work with OIRM on this series. So with that, I will pass the mic on to Shin. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So my name is uh, Shinjiro Ogawa from McEwen Stem Cell Institute. Uh, I'm working uh, liver differentiation and the liver stem cell differentiation from human pluripotent stem cell. So we are very glad to welcome Dr. Stuart Forbes, who came all the way from Scotland, despite the stormy weather in, in Toronto and in the UK and the snowy weather in Toronto. So thank you for so much for coming. I hope the weather in here in Toronto is getting better for during the stay. <laughs> So Dr. Herbs is a hepatologist and a scientist who's great interest in the liver regeneration. He's a pioneer. He has been studied for the uh, liver stem cell and the liver stem cell niche in damaged liver to understand the biology and the treat of liver disease. So he's currently the running the world's first clinical trial of macrophage therapy for liver cirrhosis patient. He's a director of the Center of Regenerative Medicine and a professor of transplantation of regenerative medicine at the University of Edinburgh. And also, he's a director of the, one of the hub of the UK regenerative medicine platform, research hub for the engineering, exploring stem cell niche for the translational research or treat liver disease. So we are very excited to hear Dr. Hobbs talk. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me through the microphone? Okay, great. I like the, um, the wipeable floors in this auditorium. Is that to get the blood from the speakers cleaned up? Is that an aggressive? you after. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, this is Prometheus, and he, uh, he's having his liver eaten, and of course it grows back every night, um, so his punishment's eternal. That's the, uh, the great feature of the liver. It can regenerate. You can't do that with a kidney. Uh, so that's why the, the liver is a great uh, a paradigm for studying regeneration. So in Scotland, we do have some eagles left, I'm pleased to say. Uh, but uh, they're not really the things eating our livers. Uh, the things eating our livers, of course, is a whiskey or alcohol. Uh, viruses, hepatitis C, hepatitis B. But now that's, they're getting treated now. Uh, but obesity, that's a, a block of lard. Uh, so obesity is the, uh, the thing that's, uh, that's doing for our livers as well. And sometimes you get all three together, in, and that's a, a good combination. So uh, it does the same thing. It eats a bit of your liver, and then the liver tries to regenerate itself. Okay, so um, if we look at uh, deaths from uh, in the UK, this, sorry, this is UK-based, uh, uh, li uh, liver disease is going up or has gone up and uh, all the other diseases are gradually beginning to fall. So um, I think, uh, you know, it, it kills uh, now more women than cervical cancer and, uh, you know, I could list to you lots of reasons. But we, we don't really get much funding for liver disease in the UK, so that's one of our problems. Um, so, so I always try and emphasise that it's an important disease. We, we do have a treatment for end-stage liver disease, and that's called liver transplantation. Uh, and um, it's, it's successful um, if you get a good liver and you don't reject it, and the immunosuppression doesn't cause you to have uh, problems such as cancer or, or liver, you know, or kidney failure or metabolic disease. 
you know, it can be a good treatment. But, but increasingly, we're getting uh, aged and more fatty livers and uh, all kinds of problems. And so it's a real challenge, liver transplantation. Even though the surgeons are fantastic and can sew the things together well, uh, the biological material is, is, is suboptimal often. So, so uh, um, and we, in, in Edinburgh, we only do about 100 a year. So think of how many people don't get a liver transplant in the whole of Scotland. So, um, okay, so uh, you can check, but uh, I think there's 19,000 uh, and just over papers on liver regeneration in PubMed. And the vast, vast majority of these have been in this paradigm where you can essentially take a normal liver and you can cut away uh, part of it and uh, in a rat or a mouse, it'll grow back in about 10 days. Uh, and uh, that happens without any drama, uh, basically. So you're deleting part of the liver here, and you can do it in humans. So we can get a very nice uh, wife or a nice husband sometimes who gives a bit of a liver to their partner. Uh, and what happens is it grows back to the same size, OK? And, um, it's the same right size for him, and it's the right size for her. Uh, and, and, and basically, all you get is a little bit of proliferation of the apatocytes uh, and the non-parenchymal cells. And, and, it's, um, and, and you can see here, if you label with BRDU, the apatocytes proliferate. So it's a, it's a very nice system. It's been studied for decades. Um, but it really, outside this one rare clinical experiment that we sometimes do, uh, it doesn't model, you know, the, the, the normal situation. The normal situation is you get lots of disease of any form and, and you get chronic injury and increasingly what you get is senescence. And, it is, and when we say, talk about senescence, we mean hepatocytes or, or biliary cells that don't divide and then you get inflammation, you get fibrosis, you get vascular changes and you get nodules and the liver shrinks and you get this... Um, uh, shrunken, scarred liver, and that really is a challenge. And that's, you know, that's the patient, and that really is not modeled by the, the mouse I've just shown you. And I guess in the latter part of my career, I've been interested in, 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 um, in really trying to create better models to understand, uh, you know, understand the clinical situation and try and bring the mouse or the bench work closer to the clinical work uh, because it, uh, they were a very long way away. And I think that, that was inhibiting a lot of our development. Um, so, so let me just talk about this. Uh, you know, as you get more scarring, you get more um, uh, senescent cells developing in the liver. These are hepatocytes in somebody with hepatitis C uh, from Graham Alexander's group, but it can be for any disease, you get similar things. Uh, but at the same time that happens, you get this thing called a ductual reaction where these, the, you get cells proliferating in the ductular space and proliferating out through the parenchyma, and they accompany it. And it's been a very, very controversial area about whether these cells give rise to apatocytes and they, they're kind of a facultative stem cell, uh, or whether they're just a, a, a pathological phenomena. And, and it's been a, a, very, a very complicated issue to sort out. Um, Part of it, for sure, is that hepatocytes can undergo a plasticity and change and revert into ductal cells. So that's going on at the same time, uh, but, but that's happening in a particular type of liver disease. So, um, as I mentioned, in human livers, pathologists have seen this senescent cells, they see these ductual reactions, and they see these intermediate cells that look halfway to hepatocyte, halfway to biliary, and the question has always been, do they have a regenerative potential? You know, and so we really, um, I mean, I work with some um, hematopoietic stem cell uh, biologists, Alexander Mabinsky's in my center, Elaine Zerzak, people like that. And so I, I really wanted to try and take a hematologist's approach to try and understand this. So what, what we did a while back was to take out ductal cells and just grow them in 2D and look at their clonogenicity and, and with faxable markers find uh, uh, cells that could be clonogenic in vitro. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can grow these over multiple passages in, in mice in, in 2D. But what we really need to do is to, to create a, a, a transplant model where there's selective advantage. And that's how 
you know, a radiation of a bone marrow is so powerful for understanding, you know, a single cell being able to expand is the niche is so conducive. And so what, what we wanted to do is try and create a model of senescence in the liver and cell death. And so by um, ser serendipity, really, we, we, we came across uh, a way of doing that by deleting MDM2 in hepatocytes uh, in a very efficient and dose-dependent way. And if we do this, we get necrosis uh, and cell death. But what we really can do is get lots and lots of senescence of the remaining hepatocytes. And that, that became a really powerful niche to try and study uh, uh, the, the, the proliferative ability of, of our cells and transplantation. So we were able to show that we could take a single cell, or, or what we think are single cells, you know, clonal popu populations growing at very low density uh, and, and then growing into colonies, and then transplant these into our mouse models. And if we do repeated induction of the MDM2 deletion, we create a niche where you can then regenerate you know, large parts of the liver uh, from that, indicating and those cells form into actually uh, hepatocytes, but also bile ducts as well, um, indicating that these cells certainly seem to have a, a, certainly at least a progenitor-like uh, capacity. And you can see here the fibrosis is reduced and the liver function's increased, uh, bilirubin goes down in, in the mice that have had the transplantation compared to controls. So that, that was a transplantable suggestion that these cells had real regenerative potential. So where, what are we doing in the, in the human situation? Well, in, in, this is one of the surgeon's nightmares, is, is you get the liver sent up to you from, from Birmingham or somewhere, and, and you can't transplant it because it's too fatty, uh, and the surgeon therefore wants to put this in the dustbin. And so, um, but what we found is that these fatty livers, okay, they can't be, the hepatocytes are, are useless, really. It's very difficult to work with the hepatocytes in fatty liver. Uh, but, the, but what we found is that they're fantastic uh, for, for, for taking out the ducts. So using the, the, the protocol developed by uh, Hans Cleavers and Mary Hush, using 3D organoids, we were able to isolate these organoids, uh, 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 isolate the ductular cells and grow as organoids. And uh, you can see if you look at a healthy liver or a fatty liver, the, the more fatty it is, uh, the more... Um, uh, ductular cells you get, the more CK19 positive ducts there are in there, and the more of these what you call triple positive cells uh, by fax isolation. And so there's, there's a much more activated ductular profile, probably because the livers are damaged and the hepatocytes are, are, are uh, struggling uh, to regenerate. Interestingly, as you, go, as, as you age, you seem to lose uh, uh, numbers of these cells. So whilst the fatty liver is good, uh, older livers become more difficult. But anyway, nonetheless, we're able to isolate these cells. And what we can do is grow them uh, you know, using a, a high-content platform using single cells um, and watch them grow. Uh, and this is just on the operetta. And what we find is um, uh, these so-called triple positive cells uh, are, are more uh, efficient at colony forming. I don't think there's anything very special about these markers. These is, and we can talk about that, why that is later, but th I think they're, they're, they're just a good way for us of isolating the cells. So what we wanted to do is try and, and test their in vivo regenerative capacity as we've done in the, in, 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 with the mouse cells. And, and um, what we've done is create a model of biliary senescence now by knocking out MDM2. Instead of knocking out MDM2 in hepatocytes, we knock out MDM2 in biliary cells. And when you knock out MDM2, uh, um, you get uh, uh, a very efficient way of in inducing liver senescence here. So, um, um, and you can see, see it here, but, but that alone is probably not enough, and what we wanted to do is add, add a biliary model onto that. And of course, we made these mice immunodeficient, so we could put human cells in there. Um, and so by um, a, a simple um, a cr crossing them with immunodeficient mice. And, and by putting them on a DDC diet, which, which causes biliary uh, casts and biliary injury and then biliary regeneration, um, by combining it, you get a, a model of biliary injury and biliary fibrosis. And you can see here, they become jaundice, the chemistry becomes very deranged. And so now we can transplant, uh, uh, sorry, it's a bit gory for lunch. Um, we can transplant uh, uh, into these mice 
they otherwise get these very big, large um, livers because they're, they're, they're intrahepatic and their hepatic, extrahepatic biliary systems are, are damaged and senescent and strictured by transplanting the, uh, the cells in, and this is via a splenic approach, uh, uh, we, we, we were able to show uh, uh, that the livers improved uh, their phenotype and their chemistry. And you can see here, if we transplant them, um, you know, uh, and, and this is just, a, this is a selected uh, area, but it's an example of where you have very disordered biliary systems that, uh, and in the transplant, those biliary systems can look reasonable. Uh, th that's just, that is a selected view, I, I must say. Uh, but you can see where we've transplanted it, you get this uh, resolving fibrosis and scar, and, and as I say, the chemistry improved. Um, interestingly, we can detect the human cells by looking for human mitochondria, and, and, and the engraftment's still inefficient, so we definitely want to improve this engraftment efficiency but what happens is that stimulates a ductular response as well, uh, which we think possibly is why they, they get good intrahepatic drainage of the livers and an inflammatory response and a macrophage response around it. Um, so, um, and if you put dye into these mice um, who have had the transplant, it flows through into the small bowel, typically, uh, unlike our controls where it often gets <coughs> stuck and it's not flowing into the, into the small bowel. So, so it's quite early, this, uh, but we do think it's encouraging as a potential cell therapy from a discarded liver. And, and, and why I think it's a good potential is those livers have been ethically sourced, uh, you know, uh, and th these are cells that would be transplanted, uh, but the ducts are ready to go, uh, but the hepatocytes aren't. And you can see if you do an MRI of the, of the mice, um, uh, uh, the common bile duct diameter shrinks, which is what you want. Uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, the gold blood diameter shrinks, which is what you want. So um, I think in human terms, these cells can be expanded as organoids, and, and I think uh, obviously Hans Cleavers and Mary Hirsch were the first to really show that, but, but um, the regenerative potential in mice, uh, I think, is, is interesting for us, and we're developing this as a human-grade cell therapy uh, it is an inefficient engraftment, but we would like to take that through to the clinic in the next uh, probably 18 months, if, po if possible, uh, for biliary disease. Now, um, at the same time as this work, we've been doing the transplantable work, there has been some very um, good papers looking at lineage tracing from the bile ducts, uh, which failed to show any um, uh, lineage tracing into hepatocytes, completely refuting the suggestion that bile ducts had a, a bipotential uh, capability or an ability to regenerate the hepatocytes. So that seemed to be a, a complete um, disconnect between the transplanted work and, and the in vivo lineage tracing work. But um, uh, when you look at, and, and again, um, if you used a virus to label uh, the hepatocytes um, and then did injury and recovery, what they, uh, these people, again, they labeled the ducts and showed no tracing, and they showed no dilation using the, the, the uh, adeno-associated virus, uh, suggesting that there was no, no contribution from an extra hepatocyte source. So, so without any doubt, these experiments were, were correctly done and were accurate for sure. Uh, but what, what uh, we found is that you know, these mouse models weren't really typical of a human disease. They had lots of hepatocyte proliferation, there wasn't much senescence, and so we wanted to try and um, look at that ourselves to try and really push the system, because I think it's only if you really push the system in the mice that it becomes like the, the human system, which, which I've been interested in. And so we've done that by knocking out um, a, a beta-1 integrin uh, using the AAV system, the AV8, which is incredibly efficient, and it gets... I wouldn't say it gets 100, but it gets very, very close to 100% and, and, and frequently does get 100% of the pad sites. Uh, but, you know, you do miss the odd one, uh, but, but very, very few. Um, and, and, and so we can knock out beta-1 integrin or, or, or use a wild, uh, wild type system, do injury and recovery, and see, it, look at the heritable tracing of these pad sites to see if they get diluted out from an extra hepatic source, a biliary source, or whether they just self-maintain. And, and what we found um, is if we do that, uh, these, these mice, if you knock out beta-1 integrin, 
it, it affects lots of physiology functions of the apatite, but basically there are loss of necrosis, um, delayed regeneration, and loss of senescence as well, uh, particularly if you add an, an additional injury as well. And so you can see here, uh, this is knocking out B1 integrin, and then doing an additional injury, it's just wide-scale necrosis. Mm -hmm. So, And if you do that in, in the wild types, you can see here they completely heritably label themselves with injury and repair, so they're not, not, um, they're not getting regenerated from an extra hepatic source at all. But here, you're beginning to see areas, patches, uh, where hepatocytes are, are not labeled from an hepatocyte source, suggesting a potential extra hepatic uh, source um, of, of regeneration. And so we used a couple of strategies to use positive lineage tracing, and this is just one of them. Uh, and it was just a straight overexpression of P21, um, in, uh, which again, uh, you can see is very efficient to, to try and inhibit uh, hepatocyte proliferation and try and model human disease. And if you do, the, do that and then add an injury uh, here with carbon tetrachloride, well, you can see the, what, the control. These hepatocytes proliferate very widely with key 67. But here, uh, the, you really shut off hepatocyte proliferation. Um, in, in this system. So, so overexpressing P21 works like a dream, really, uh, uh, for this kind of thing. And you can see now, if you lineage trace the ducts using the K19 Cree, um, uh, there's no uh, uh, trace out in the wild type that get the scrambled uh, vector. Uh, but with the, these, uh, you do get hepatite labeling around the ducts. And um, if you pull out uh, hepatite, uh, and do um, you know, uh, uh, sequencing and principal component analysis, looking at drug-derived hepatocytes uh, versus indigenous hepatocytes uh, versus um, um, uh, bile ducts here. So if you have the bile ducts here in green and then the, the, the drug-derived hepatocytes in red and the kind of indigenous <coughs> hepatocytes here, you can see that they, 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 they seem to map on pretty close to their genetic basis. So, so um, um, that, that um, let's see if this works. Yeah, just click on it. Oh, no, not like that, sorry. Uh, try that. Yeah, so, and, and you can do 3D reconstructions of uh, these, these biliary cells and the biliary derived hepatocytes. And they are, really are like a, a, a tree with the leaves on the tree all branching out, and they are all interconnected. You don't find isolated cells. Uh, they really are all, all connected to each other. So there you go. OK. So I think um, you know, we don't really know a great deal about the biology of this, but I think, I think it's an interesting uh, paradigm. And there's a, been a nice paper from Mary Hush uh, published in Nature Cell Biology on this, um, uh, looking at both organoid formation and, uh, and disease modeling of these ductular responses. And essentially, it's a, it's a good read if you're into your epigenetics. But um, uh, it, when the cells, these ducts form organoids, they undergo widespread um, genetic transcriptional changes and, and, and epigenetic changes. Uh, and the organoids model the disease ductular reaction quite well, in fact, here, you can see at the genetic level. And essentially, um, there's a lot of uh, epigenetic changes uh, and, wide, and this goes widespread um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, methylation and, um, sorry, I'm just blanking on the actual thing. Yeah, sorry. So, so, so what they went, they found they looked at the TET1 knockout mice. And um, uh, what they found with the TET1 knockout mice uh, is that it, it, with the TET1 knockout mice, these cholangiocytes, if you do injury, injury and recovery, uh, they don't regenerate hepatocytes. These mice get fibrosed, uh, and their, their livers function very poorly uh, compared, uh, compared to the wild types, where you get derived hepatocytes and good liver function. So, um, oops. So I think, I think this is very provocative, and I think there's a lot to do on this. Uh, but I think it's, it's a really interesting, it's one of these papers that opens a lot of questions rather than closes it, closes it down. 
So I think um, at this point I would say that induced senescence can model liver pathology. Uh, hepatocyte senescence models a it triggers a ductular response, uh, and the ductular cells can uh, regenerate hepatocytes. Uh, and we really need to understand the molecular and the genetic approaches, uh, uh, such as Mary Hush has been doing very nicely. Okay, so just segueing on to senescence, as I've talked about it quite a lot, and everyone talk, thinks about senescence as, as a sort of growing old thing, but clearly it's also an injury thing. And we, we, we became interested in this in the biliary ducts, and we looked in, in, in patients with uh, biliary disease, primary sclerosing cholangitis, primary biliary cirrhosis. And what we found is that um, uh, um, biliary ducts become frequently senescent uh, uh, with increasing uh, injury uh, in, the, in, these, in these situations, which, okay, is probably not too surprising. But, but what we wanted to try and do is see whether the senescence was a consequence of a disease or whether it also had a, an effect in triggering the pathology as well. And so we really went back to, to our mouse models and again, our biliary model where we trigger senescence with the MDM2. And, and what we found is that if, those, if, if we did that and put these mice on, onto this diet, the DDCD diet, if they had in, induced senescence in their ducts, they get much more fibrosis. Uh, obviously, proliferation was turned off, uh, uh, and they did very badly, these mice. And, and this really mirrors human uh, PSC very nicely, actually, at the pathological level. And in fact, um, what was interesting, and, and we didn't really fully understand the, the, the significance of this straight away, is if you induce senescence in, in the bile ducts in a very clean way, it, it doesn't touch the hepatocytes, it just touches the bile ducts of K19 Cre, and then do a partial hepatectomy. These mice uh, do very badly, their livers don't regenerate. Um, uh, uh, but what was interesting is if you look at proliferation in the hepatocytes in the parenchyma, it completely uh, shuts down uh, or, or, or significantly reduces proliferation in the parenchyma. Given that we'd done the genetic alteration in the bile ducts, that certainly gave us, we, we, we got us thinking about why that was. And we didn't fully understand the consequences of that, really. Uh, or we understood that it was happening and the mice were doing very badly. But we started wondering about transmission of senescence between one cell type and another in vivo. And just to say, we, we found that this is a very uh, TGFB, uh, um, was very active in the, in the mice that is a regular t um, uh, the senescence, and I won't labor that point, but it gives us a way to use small molecule inhibitors of TGF beta um, as a direct target um, uh, uh, looking to try and inhibit the senescence development in these mice. And if we did this, we found that we could turn off the P21 response. Um, and um, uh, we could inc increase the proliferation in their ducts and, and reduce the fibrosis. But the fibrosis probably is not that surprising as TGF-beta is a strong driver of fibrosis, as you will know. Uh, but we were encouraged by the, the parenchymal re responses to the small, small molecule. Sorry. But what, what really kind of took a long time for us to really appreciate is, is is that senescence uh, was occurring in, in acute liver disease, and where, the, where there's no aged liver, no chronicity of injury, purely acute injury. So, so this is somebody that's taken acetaminophen, so that's paracetamol in the UK, t probably Tylenol here. Um, so these are, these are people that are 19, 20 years old, no history of liver disease, perfectly normal livers. And they take these overdoses, and they get widespread necrosis. And, and, and we started looking at the... And, and if, you, if, you, if you take a small overdose, I'm not encouraging it, but if you take a small overdose, there's a good chance you can recover. But if you take a big overdose, your liver really doesn't regenerate. And it should do, because there's hepatocytes there, but it just doesn't regenerate. And, and we, we looked at this, and to our shock, we found that the more damage there was, the less regeneration there was per cell. And in fact, the senescence uh, was present. So in the perinecrotic areas, all the hepatocytes were, were in P21. You couldn't find proliferating hepatocytes at all. And that was really counter to, to, to what, what we'd learned um, you know, in my, in my tech, you know, PhD. 
And so, uh, again, we went back to the models and started trying to model it with um, uh, carbon tetrachloride or acetaminophen using healthy young mice, but giving them a, a, an acute injury. And we get the same thing. We've, we've got this uh, uh, senescent P21 se uh, positive cells next to the necrotic area and, and reduced proliferation as well. So that's just a P21. And what we found um, is it was P21 dependent. So if we did this in P21 knockout mice, uh, this perinecrotic area of P21, of course, goes away with P21 knockout. Of course, that's true. That's a, a sort of self-evident fact. But, but what we were able to show is that the proliferation now was, was restored in this perinecrotic area. The key 67 positive cells are now there. They're proliferating. And, they get, and now we've restored the relationship between injury, that's a ALT at the bottom, and regeneration, which is what we, we anticipate, rather than this, than this sort of paradoxical relationship that we'd seen. And again, it, it was one of the signals is TGF beta. I won't labor this point because uh, it's published, but it did give us an opportunity to use TGF beta inhibitors. And again, by doing that, we were able to show using uh, a large dose of paracetamol that normally kills the mice, though they, they, they nearly all survived using TGF beta inhibitors, which was really surprising to us. And again, uh, we could restore, uh, um, uh, reduce, sorry, P21 and restore the proliferation. So again, more injury, more regeneration, which is what, what we wanted rather than the paradox. And what we found is that, the, and, and, and it's a complicated story really, uh, but it's in the paper, is, is that senescence transmits from cell to cell. Uh, uh, and, and if you block it early, um, it, you've got a chance, but if you don't, it can really, it, you know, it really take hold. So, okay, TGF beta is a mediator and can potentially be targeted. I, I think it's attractive in acute injury. Uh, in chronic, you might be a little bit worried. Uh, uh, but it, maybe it's something we should do acutely. Okay, so just in the last section of my talk, um, I'm going to talk about uh, um, development of a cell therapy, uh, the macrophage cell therapy, and kind of how we got there. So, um, uh, and, and I'll leave time for questions. So, um, okay, so this is my prejudice. My prejudice is, is if you take a part size and put them into a normal environment uh, or, or, or a metabolic liver disease um, where basically you're doing cellular gene therapy and the niche is healthy, the soil's good, I think you're going to get a good result. And I think therefore stem cell derived apart sites for that in, are going to do well, okay? But my prejudicial view is that in cirrhosis where you've got all this nasty scarring and inflammation and horrible stony ground, that apart site transplantation has been historically terrible, and so why would stem cell derived apatocytes be such a great thing? Okay, and I think that's that's that that that's really um, that's really the issue here. That the historical cases of apatocyte transplant are not encouraging at all. So I think when you get this horrible thing, you've got to do two things. You really want to try and stimulate regeneration, but you want to try to also break down the scar tissue as well. And, and, and allow that healing to go on. And we know uh, if you take away these diseases, even a cirrhotic liver can partially regenerate. Now, it doesn't go completely go back to normal, but it would partially regenerate. And that might be somebody that's in the clinic or in the, in the wards, and maybe this person's an outpatient, okay? So we know it can occur, but sometimes it just doesn't have enough oomph to get it all there. This is a patient with viral hep hepatitis B, actually, uh, they got the anti-hepatitis B treatment, that's all the scarring, and you can see here there's very little scarring and, and it's regenerated nicely. So that's a human experiment. And John Idell in Edinburgh uh, with Jeremy Duffield um, uh, um, and, uh, uh, initiated thinking about this and showed that uh, macrophages uh, influx into the scar when this regeneration occurs, and they therefore thought were macrophages uh, uh, in, you know, relevant to this, and I got involved a little bit, but they were the drivers of this, and they showed that if you deplete macrophages using a, um, um, a diphtheria toxin strategy, um, if you deleted macrophages during the recovery phase, you got less recovery and you got less scar resolution, suggesting that macrophages were pivotal. Okay, so 
and, and there was a number of things. At the same time, I was working on macrophages in, in, in the niche, in the parenchymal response, and um, uh, Luke Balter, a student of mine uh, who's now a, a group leader, had shown that uh, macrophages uh, had, had a strong influence in, in, in this sort of niche, uh, helping to eat uh, dead material, secrete wince, and really pattern the regenerative response as well. Uh, and another student of mine had shown that uh, macrophages were involved in stimulating the ductular response. So we were really interested in that from that point of view, from parenchymal thing. So that came together and made me think, well, maybe we could develop a cell therapy in mice. And, and this is now ancient history, 2011. I'm embarrassed to show it, but what we did is a very simple thing. Give mice uh, fibrosis with carbon tetrachloride, inject macrophages, uh, CSF1-induced macrophages matured but not polarized, and the scar goes down, and, and, and uh, you get this regenerative response, and the liver function improves. Uh, collagen goes down, hydroxyproline goes down, alpha smarvies is smooth muscle lactin positive myofibroblasts go down, uh, and, um, and uh, it was quite a profound response, and you can see MMPs, uh, get upregulated. These are the enzymes that break down scar. And, and really, the effects we saw were quite remarkable and, and, and surprisingly large. But what we worked out was that, that um, for every cell you inject, um, the host contributes six. So, so, every, so if we look at injecting macrophages, uh, uh, the, the macrophages we inject home to the scar, to the scar area, but every cell we added, uh, the host would, would, would add, add, add six of them to amplify the effect. And the macrophages we were injecting were, were pumping out chemokines, so it wasn't surprising really, but it was really quite encouraging for us translationally. So we thought, well, okay, let's, let's think about doing this in humans, but I was quite negative about trying it, but I thought, okay, they took, I, I gave my monocytes, uh, and you can give a few billion monocytes without any problem. That's, you have lots of them. And, and we were able to show that my monocytes could be differentiated into macrophages, and in, a, in an immunosuppressed mouse with uh, common tet, they can reduce fibrosis and uh, increase liver function. So, so that was one encouragement, um, but you know, maybe that's just me. Uh, people say I'm a bit mousy. Um, but the other thing is, uh, what we were able to show is, is, is if you take monocytes from, from disease patients, um, we know people with cirrhosis have abnormal monocytes, but if you take those monocytes out of the body and differentiate them into, into so-called regenerative macrophages or re mature macrophages, they, 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 they could uh, uh, be, be differentiated just the same. So you could put them in, you know, in, our, in our very simple culture techniques outside the body, and even these abnormal monocytes could, could be converted into macrophages. And, and uh, the gene expression from healthy volunteers versus disease uh, was not too bad at all. So again, that encouraged us. So we really had no excuses then to try and do a, a trial. So um, essentially, uh, what we, we decided to do was a phase one trial uh, followed by phase two. So we're now in phase two. So this is a dose escalation protocol where we, in patients with cirrhosis, where we gave them 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. Uh, and then um, you take out the monocytes at apheresis, differentiate them uh, into these macrophages and reinfuse them peripherally. Luckily, they're home to the liver, which is very good. Uh, and, um, and now we're on to the phase two. So, in, in, of course, in Edinburgh, we took people with alcoholic liver disease, some hepatitis C who, who'd been cured of hepatitis C, some with biliary disease, and uh, some with fatty liver. So it was a mixture. And, um, you know, we looked at, of course, you have to record all the adverse events, and the adverse event profile was reasonably good, which is the main part of a phase one study. But uh, interestingly, if you look at the MELD score, which is a, a, a thing that predicts, um, it's, a, it's a clinical score of liver function. It predicts survival at a month, three months, and a year. Uh, um, we saw at the top dose, it's, um, you know, it's quite interesting uh, a drop in, in um, in MELD, which was, which was encouraging. And so um, uh, that, w that was something that, uh, uh, you know, there's no control arm, so it's not an experiment, uh, but, it, but the, the, it, it, did, it didn't discourage us. 
And if we look to ELF, so this is a serum marker of fibrosis, and again, it's a composite score which is used clinically to, to, to mirror, and it mirrors uh, 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 scarring in the liver, and it goes down when you get treatment for hepatitis C. Again, uh, we saw some encouraging falls in the ELF, and, and also these so-called Nordic biomarkers, which are fragments uh, of collagen. Uh, again, uh, that, was, that was good, and the quality of life uh, was fine. People didn't find it too difficult to do. So um, again, by looking at dose, uh, uh, we, we, see a, we see a dose effect, and I, I don't need to, to stay on that. And again, this is a uh, fiber scan. So this is where you actually put a, uh, you shoot a beam of uh, uh, um, ultrasound into the liver uh, and look for stiffness. Uh, and again, uh, it's a measure of fibrosis, a surrogate measure of fibrosis. And again, we got these encouraging changes. But I have to say, it's not an experiment. There's no control arm. So, so uh, uh, you know, but it was certainly encouraging to, to go into the phase two. So we're now, we're now halfway through this and, and trying to ramp it up uh, to get through it. So we're looking at ascites, encephalopathy, bleeding, peritonitis, and of course, need for transplant and death. So they're pretty hard endpoints. Uh, I don't know how it's going because it's all blinded. Uh, but we'll, we'll report it as soon as we get the data. And then just in the final couple of minutes, um, the last thing we're getting into is now macrophages for acute liver injury. So I've talked about paracetamol, uh, common in the uh, United Kingdom, less common in the States, but is the most common cause of acute liver failure. Uh, if you get in early, there's an antidote, but late presentation, there's no treatment. So that's a big problem. And so you get all this necrosis, and we thought, well, you get so much necrosis, maybe the macrophages can go and eat the dead stuff. So it wasn't very sophisticated thinking. Uh, you know, you get these, uh, you don't really die of liver failure with, uh, with the acute liver disease. What you die of is in lack of immunity. You die of lack of comfort cells, I think, because what happens is you get uh, an endotoxemia, the bugs go out of your gut, the, the gut's leaky, you don't have enough uh, barrier function here. You don't have enough comfort cells. There's this lots of necrotic material where the bugs can grow, and you, and you get inflammation, and then you go into multi-organ failure. And unless you get a transplant, you're in big trouble, really. Um, and we just thought that maybe if we, give um, uh, if we give macrophages, maybe they'll go to the liver, eat the necrotic material, and boost immunity, turn off inflammation. Not very sophisticated thinking. but. Um, the beautiful thing about the macrophages for liver is that they, they home to the liver very successfully. And after, li after injury, they home even better. So you can label the macrophages and show that. Um, and then just doing a very simple experiment where we do paracetamol. Uh, and now, now in, in a late time point where N-acetylcysteine doesn't work, the this is beyond the, overdose, beyond the antidote, um, you can, you can, you, we wanted to test it. And, and, and we wanted to test different sorts of cells, classically activated and alternatively activated cells, and deactivated. And the reason uh, was uh, we had a feeling that, the, the, that some cells would work better than others. And indeed, these alternatively activated cells were the best at reducing necrosis in the livers, uh, which was encouraging. So necrosis uh, reduction was the best with those alternatively activated cells. And also, they were best at stimulating proliferation in the liver, or, or one of the best. It just, that's just simple cell counts. Um, and um, if you look, the, the cells that proliferated were the apatocytes and the, and the endothelium. And um, it reduces inflammation in the liver. Uh, if you look at neutrophil counts or HMGB1, that goes down with the acti alternatively activated cells. And if you look at serum cytokines, um, uh, again, the alternatively activated compared to control, now we focus down on these, uh, seem to be the best at reducing inflammation. Uh, and uh, so this was encouraging. And, um, and if you give a high dose, uh, again, it, it works even with a high dose. So just very finally, you can see these markers over time with the, with the macrophage therapy. It, the effect persists long, you know, quite till, till recovery. And uh, we wanted to understand why. And these alternatively activated cells are the best at eating. So if you use these um, uh, reporter uh, beads uh, that fluoresce, uh, when the macrophages eat them, um, 
you can see that the alternatively activated ones are the ones that eat, eat the best. And so we found the same in the human cells. Um, and in a, in a mouse model, when we give human cells, uh, the alternatively activated again work. They go to the liver and uh, they reduce necrosis and they, they're increasing, uh, uh, they're reducing inflammation. So the IL-10, IL-12 ratio, which is a clinical uh, marker that we use, is improved with the macrophages. Uh, I'll skip the proliferation. So what we think they're doing is going uh, to the liver, uh, they're eating dead material, they, they, they're cross-talking with the inflammatory cells, they're stimulating proliferation. And again, um, uh, they reduce inflammation. And again, we're looking to perform a phase one study uh, in paracetamol overdose in, in patients that come in. So, so that, um, that's the end. I'd like to thank, obviously, my group have been very supportive. We couldn't do any of the translational work without our, our colleagues in SMBTS who help us develop GMP protocols and, and our funders. Uh, and I'd uh, be grateful uh, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for a great talk. So, any question from the audience? Ah, so go. In your ductal responses, mm -hmm. do you think it's a subset of ductal cells that do this, or is it a general part of the yeah. biliary tree? I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing. So, so by um, CD133 seems to, so, so, so there's, a, there's a group that's got a CD133 Cree and that seems to be one third of the ducts, and it's sort of every third cell uh, is CD133 positive. It's very, very beautiful. And so we think that they, and it, I'm not, whether a cell can just, you know, if you talk to Hans Clevers, he'll say every cell is the same, and that, and the one, you know, they, they, they'll take, they'll take, adopt that phenotype. So I, I'm not sure at the moment, because everything we do, even if we extract from a normal undamaged bile duct, we find about a third of the cells are CD133 positive. Uh, and they're certainly most clonogenic. But I, I'm not saying that they aren't the only clonogenic cells. So what I don't, I, I think it's hard for me to know is whether the cells just adopt that phenotype um, or, 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 or whether it's a restricted to that. And I, I don't have the, the answer to that at the moment. But the, the lineage tracing is very intriguing of every third cell. Mm -hmm. Very nice talk. Um, in your in the macrophage story, where you're putting back macrophages that yeah. you've tuned yeah. with IL-4 and yeah, IL-13, yeah. yeah. do you think it's possible to re-educate the endogenous macrophages yeah. that are part of the environment yeah, so to maybe skip the isolation process? Yeah. So, so I think that's a good question. So I definitely think you can do with things like you might be able to de 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 you know you might be able to deliver your fit into leukine either uh, systemically or, or tar target a particular organ. So I definitely think that's possible. I think when you've got a severely damaged liver and there's no hardly any macrophages there because you've just got huge amounts of necrosis and, and the ones that are there have eaten and they can't do any more, you know, and, and they're looking very sick. I think, I think, you know, you're adding, kind of trying to add jet fuel to something that's blown apart, you know, it's not going to work. So I think it'll work up to a point, but I think when you get a really damaged situation, you really kind of need something to eat all the, eat all the mess. And then, and then add back. You really need an add back experiment. So, so I think in the early stage of disease, definitely. Hi, very good talk. I was wondering about the macrophage story. So you deliver extra macrophages. Yeah. How do you control them after, like, you want them to stop eating things? Yeah, so, I mean, we don't really, so, uh, but they, 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 they don't proliferate and they're not around very long. So I think they're very different to, say, CAR T cells. So uh, we were talking about this before. I think, I think if you like, their, their weakness is that they, they're not going to keep doing it. They're just going to do what they do over one round and then that'll be it. But you can re-inject them, you know, you, you know, you can repeat administer. Maybe that's a strength as well for the safety point of view. And I just have another question. Um, when you inject your macrophages, you say that they home to the liver. Yeah. Is the liver the only place they go to? Like, what is the no, so efficiency? The, yeah, so they go to the liver and spleen. So, um, I mean, I, I haven't shown all the background data, but if you, if you inject them um, peripherally in the mouse, uh, they'll go to the lungs. 
where they'll be there for a few hours and then they'll slowly disappear by say six hours or, or so and you'll start seeing them in the liver and by 24 hours they're almost all in the liver and spleen. By number, um, the majority in the liver, but they, are, they do like the spleen as well. Thank you. But, but it, it was a worry. The first time I did it, I was a bit worried about embolus in the lung. Hi. So just with the senescence story, I guess at one point you showed that there's sort of a reduced function over aging. Um, yeah. And I just wondered if you think that that's uh, a niche-related effect or it's something inherent in the cells like mutations uh, over aging that might be causing that. Yeah, so I think it's likely to be both because, I mean, I think our data definitely shows a niche effect. So, so I can, and I haven't, we've got data what now where we can put in um, healthy cells into a, into, a, into a senescent environment and they will be infected, in inverted commas, by senescence. So, so there's definitely a niche effect. And, 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 you know, I wonder why that, I wonder if that's one of the reasons why, I, why hepatite transplant doesn't work for fulminant liver failure. Okay, interesting. Thanks. And, and, and in fact, we've got a story we're putting together on this, and we can block it. Because if you transplant the cells into a, into a senescent environment, they don't proliferate. So it's not surprising it doesn't work. But it was quite surprising to find it. No, I don't think anyone would look. We hadn't looked. I, I know you're monitoring metalloprotease activity yeah. and, mm. and expression. Mm. Uh, have you looked at Adam proteases, Adam 10 and 17? Not, because no, those not, not in this. No, yeah, that's because those question. are really yeah. also involved in uh, mobilization of certain of the yeah. uh, growth factors that m you might require for liver regeneration. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's a very good, good yeah. question. We, we haven't looked at that specifically with the macrophages, but... Um, uh, not, 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 in, not in the macrophages, but in s some of the regeneration scenarios oh, as yeah. well. We, we have yeah. in that, um, I mean, we, we published a story, all, uh, you know, partly related to that and pol partly related to polysiae, um, which you probably know about in, in terms of the ductular response uh, and, and the atoms, as you say. So, so that's in, in hepatology, too. So uh, you're, at least in one of your scenarios, when you put macrophages in, you induce some hepatocyte proliferation. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if we get back to restoring yeah. hepatocyte function, what if you transplant both hepatocytes and macrophages? Yeah. Do you think that would be a better shot? Um, yeah, I think, I think it potentially could be because, um, you know, it depends whether you're talking about acute or chronic. Let's think about acute to start with because, you know, the big problem you've got is a lot of necrosis. You give them macrophages, they're going to eat the dead stuff. You can put in hepatocytes. I think that would be a good environment to do that. So, so Maybe I, stagger them a bit. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I absolutely think that that's a, a potential way forward, yeah. I have a same idea. That's a, you know, for the, because of liver cirrhosis, as, a, as you mentioned, the soil is very damaged. Yeah. That's why we, when we can transplant hepatocyte, but uh, hepatocyte cannot see it over there. Yeah. Mm. That's why my question is, uh, if in case uh, macrophage therapy accelerates liver regeneration, yeah. is that there some uh, distinct uh, population of hepatocyte can contribute to the liver regeneration? Ah. Um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know, embarrassingly. That's a really good and obvious question. Yeah, you, so you're talking about the zonality in, yeah, in okay. responsiveness. Yeah. So, so um, hmm, don't know. So, I, so I, in paracetamol, there's no zone three. Yeah. So, so they're gone, uh, if they're dead. Um, but in the chronic, I haven't looked at that, so it's a really good question. I haven't seen any zonality from memory, but uh, I'm gonna go back and have a look at that. So macrophages, just say one thing. Um, macrophages can make injury worse. So in an injury, f in, in, in during progression, macrophages can cause fibrosis, cause inflammation. So I'm not saying they're a panacea, but in the resolution phase is, is where I'm, I'm suggesting they may be potential. I didn't say that clearly before. Okay, thank you for a nice, great talk, and uh, we please join the thanks to Dr. Sir. And Stephanie. Talks.
So, um, hi, uh, I have the honor to thank Dr. Forbes again for uh, Professor Forbes for his talk again. I'm a scientist at the McEwen Institute as well. And as the way of saying thank you, I actually got to reach behind you. We have a little present for oh. you. Yes, wow. we do. <laughs> and it's a new present. Most of you guys probably haven't seen that yet. So it's, it's nicely packed. We're not oh. going to necessarily unpack it. I'll tell you what's inside. It's very though. light. So we, we give you this. It is, <laughs> it's, it's light, but it's fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's empty, that's why I don't want you to open it's it. Support. Support. <laughs> so uh, it is a present to hopefully remind you of this ah, trip to Toronto, you. to that's meeting fantastic. the research community here and the new people you met and connected with. Um, it is actually artwork from Toronto, from oh. a local artist. Her name is, could I looked it up, sorry, Julie Bell, and it's a vase, so, and it's a graphic painting on it. Oh, that right. you might want to think of looking like cells or a liver that's damaged, I'm not sure. That's fantastic. <laughs> so she is a local artist here, but she's uh, well known in the world. A lot of people have her art at home, so worldwide, like in the US and uh, Canada, obviously, but also Germany, England, and now in Scotland, we'll have a piece of her work. Well, I'm incredibly <laughs> grateful. Thank you very much. And I don't want to do the experiment, see if it can be put back together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to, you know, it might look fancy if you put it together after, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much for hot. your talk and Thank sharing you your research. Pleasure. And I remind everybody of the next uh, Global Speakers Talk that will happen in April 21st at noon in this room again. And we will have Anne Burnett, a uh, professor of genetics at Stanford University School of Medicine, coming next. Thank you, everybody, coming out.